All right, I'll give you more lines on the next Recipode. You're welcome. Oh, hello Chip Dippers. Welcome back to Retro Recipes. And today we're going to be taking a not boring look into the world of the Amstrad PC. But this doesn't mean I'm just randomly starting to do episodes on the history of certain computers. You see, the Amstrad PC 1512 is the last remaining computer to go in my retro museum. Everything you see behind me, myself or my father had when I was growing up. And that PC 1512 made by Amstrad is the one that I've yet to acquire. But I found one for a really good price and I've acquired it. So come with me as we take a deep dive into the world of the Amstrad personal computer. Welcome to Retro Recipes. See, no puns. Welcome. So let's unpack my new old Amstrad PC1512 that I found on Fleabay. Now it's very much the done thing with retro channels to take you through a full refurbishment and recapping of acquisitions like this. So I'm not going to, but there are two reasons for that. Firstly, this machine was advertised as being in great cosmetic condition and fully working. And first signs are that that is true. Secondly, honestly, I just can't wait to boot it up and see its unique graphic user interface again for myself for the first time since 1986. And I have really fond memories of setting it up back then with my dad in his home office when I was just 13. L'autre jour, je vois le compatible d'Amstrad, le PC1512, très professionnel et très joueur. Amstrad, écran souris et logiciel. And there's a story behind my dad getting this machine. You see, he had the Amstrad PCW at the time, just like I have now in my retro museum. But he was looking to upgrade to something more powerful. And I'd been just blown away by one single image Amstrad were using in the advertisements for its shiny new PC. I have a really vivid memory of also seeing this image on display in Dixon's in Richmond, Southwest London. Now, being 13, I didn't research megahertz or kilobytes, but the advertising worked as this tiger looked so damn cool to me back in that day that I told my dad this was the machine. It had to be, right? So my rather unconventional main goal with this video, as well as learning a few things along the way, is for us to try to get that image back up on the machine once more 30 years later. It's kind of ambitious. I don't know if that image is on the original discs. I don't know if the discs that I bought separately some time ago even work. And I don't know if the floppy drive works either. Don't you hate it when your floppy doesn't work? Well, anyway, launched for £500 in 1986 by Mr. Alan Michael Sugar, hence the AMS initials of Amstrad. That's my initials too, what? AMS. What? So I should get some something in all of this. <laughs> it was billed as mostly PC compatible, and that was in a time when PC ownership was really rare, especially in Europe. So this machine kind of opened up the European market to the very idea of PCs. Si vous vous contentez d'acheter n'importe quel micro-ordinateur, vous risquez de vous retrouver tout nu. Avec l'Amstrad PC 1512, compatible avec qui, vous savez, tout est compris. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And indeed, it even shipped with its own version of MS-DOS on this rather fetching red disc. It was a special version that Amstrad had licensed from Microsoft. Wait, exploiting? And until now, I didn't actually have a PC of any kind in my collection. So this is going to be really useful for future PC videos. Now, don't get me wrong, I loved PCs growing up. I built several of them, but those beige kind of boring boxes, but they were rather uninspired compared to this, which had a bit of character to it. Now it also came with Digital Research's DOS Plus, which included CPM compatibility, meaning in some cases software from my Amstrad PCW or from the Amstrad CPC could run if you had versions ported to five and a quarter inch discs. In fact, these multicolored floppy disks 
are one of my enduring memories. Um, you remember my three inch floppy that you sat on? Yes. <sighs> Sorry, can you get up? You're sitting on my three inch floppy. Oh, these things are hard. Well, it's gone all big and red now. Does it have the organ trail on it? The organ trail? Organ trail. Oh, it's pronounced Oregon. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah. Now, before I do clean this up just a little bit, I can't really wait to just turn it on and see if it does indeed work. And it has this interesting system where the power supply is actually in the monitor, not the main unit. And the monitor then sends power down through this cable to the surprisingly lightweight main box. Speaking of power, this is from Greece, which runs on the 240 volt power system. So I'll need this step up power converter to connect it to my poultry 115 volt US main supply. <gasps> oh, not that kind of poultry puppy fractic. All right, fingers crossed. Here it goes. Hmm, nothing. Oh, there's a second power switch right here. Oh, yay, indeed. Hopefully that's just the vertical hold. Yes. Oh, oh. yes. Oh. Yes. This literally gives me tingles seeing this again. Hmm, that's not good though. Maybe it's just the disc, not the drive. And this machine is incredibly quiet. I don't know if you can hear, but there's nothing to hear. Um, there's no fan. And I think that's probably because that power supply is in the very well vented monitor, which just cools itself via convection. It's rather unconvectional. Unfortunately, false rumors spread about this, stating that the machine would overheat because it didn't have a fan. Ooh. And these rumors were even before Twitter. Yeah. So later versions of this machine included a fan for no particular other reason. Good job, Rimamungus. If it's the difference between people buying the machine or not, I'll stick a bloody fan in it. If they want bright pink spots on it, I'll do that too. What is the use of me banging my head against a brick wall and saying you don't need the damn fan, sunshine? Some genuine footage there of Alan Michael's sugar. Uh, but these discs now seem to be working okay which gives me a little sunshine. Okay, so now we know it works, which means we'll know if we break something whilst cleaning it. Because whilst I'm not doing a full refurb, I can at least give it a good wipe down and disinfection with trusty alcohol wipes. Can you just keep an eye on it while I go grab them? Cheers. Alright, I'm back. Anything happen while I was gone? No? Cool. Have you seen my toothbrush? No. And we'll just sort out this misalignment. Then disaster struck. Jeez. Well, near disaster. And I think it's time to remove this sticker but at least we can add where it was made into the info in this video.
Now this keyboard is rather crusty, to quote the end beta. Oh, and you can see the interesting characters on this one. It's all Greek to me. And I think we should use the dishwasher method that I used to really good effect on my Commodore 64 in a dishwasher video. Now I'm not recommending that you should or shouldn't do this with your electronics, but because I just want to start using this, I don't really want to touch all that crust. Uh, it's just a method that suits me. I always put the dishwasher pod in there for the simple reason that it contains not just soap, but also anti-corrosives, which will actually not just clean, but also protect the electrical parts and contacts inside, just like it does with your fork and knives. And can we just take a moment to thank the previous owner for removing the batteries that sit here under the monitor? Says a thread is store. That's thank you in Greek. Opa! Also of note is this physical volume control for the PC beeper, something I don't think exists on any other PC. Revolutionary. Now it has this super easy to access section here for expansion cards and for a memory upgrade from 512 to a whopping 640 kilobytes and even an optional 20 megabyte hard disk. And that's one of the things I have really vivid memories of. Going from systems like the Apple IIe and then the Amstrad PCW, this was our first time actually experiencing a machine that had a hard disk option. And the revelation that you could fit the equivalent of maybe 40 disks into one just was amazing for the time. You can watch. How is that even possible? The dishwasher tied it in a knot. Don't drink the keyboard juice. video output of the PC-1512 was compatible with the CGA standard, with an extension allowing all 16 colors to be used in the 640 by 200 graphics mode. And the CPU of both the PC-1512 and the later PC-1640, the upgraded model, was an 8 MHz Intel 8086, which was more than sufficient for playing, well, let's say, Prince of Persia. And speaking of processors, I recommend JCB at uh, PCB Way! Did you know it's Christmas soon ish? And they're offering free PCBs and a $10 discount with the code CHRISTMAS10. Because as we all know, PCB stands for PCB per. Doesn't it? So, with everything back together and looking a little fresher than it did at first, come with me as we dive into the thing I've been waiting for booting up that GUI and trying to find our tiger. Amstrad licensed Digital Research's GEM operating system, standing for Graphical Environment Manager. And you'll have seen a version of it in the good old Atari ST. And if you think it looks more familiar even than that, well, yeah, Apple went on to sue Digital Research, forcing them to change several features in GEM version two.
And yeah, you can see here the symptoms of Apple's lawsuit is these floppy disk icons that used to be over here. Well, that was Tim Macintoshy. So this is the bit I've really been looking forward to. So let's explore what we've got in here. That's right, I remember now, you could save the basic programs in Gem. So here's the uh, dialogue, here's the actual basic program, and here's what you would see like on a Commodore 64 screen instead. Now I do apologize for the filming quality of this. Because the lines are so crisp on this screen, it's actually causing this kind of weird um, strobing pattern. Actually, that's one of my fondest memories. Uh, my father actually bought the CM version, not MM, color monitor. And I remember how crisp and vivid these lines were. And I would set my DOS screen to have a red background and white text. It looked almost like it was made of gel or something. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but such a great monitor on these machines. But because it's so crisp, we see these little anomalies. Phone book. Let's go with a neat one. Add a number, okay. And some nice options here within basic as well. Sweet. I remember this so well. You know when you haven't seen something for so long and just the shape and the textures and the icons and fonts really brings back memories. Another thing I remember is that's my dad's initials. And it was kind of funny to me that the basic extension was BAS. Should have been AMS. It's good at graphics too. Can't do that on a Commodore really, can you? Let's draw a circle radius 2000 units. I mean, that's lovely, isn't it? Isn't that great? You can change the color and the fill. Nice work, Phil. There's a whole series of interesting effects that's for our viewers in Australia. Wow. Pretty fast, too. I mean, remember, this is a 16-bit machine. But special effects is not all Basic 2 is good at. Go back to the desktop. Speaking of the desktop, you know, remember this came out in 1986 and Microsoft Windows 3.1, which most of us used, wasn't out until six years later. So this kind of windowed environment on a PC was something of a revelation. That's enough of the basic stuff. Uh, let's just see what we've got up here. Standard things. Well, thank you very much, Lee and Greg. And Jim, of course. So let's explore some Jam apps and maybe I'll find my tiger in here. Nope. <laughs> feel like uh, I'm on a safari hunting for this tiger. This isn't the disc you're looking for. Let's try this. DOS Plus, but also Jam Paint. Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> I really want this to work. Presumably, to change discs, we just open it up like this. Well, the disc works. That's a good start. Paint app. Ah, oh, I've got goosebumps now. Obviously, it's quite like Mac Paint, uh, but then wasn't everything. Yeah, let's let's just try a quick bit of drawing. Those were the days, huh? When you had nothing better to worry about than making fun patterns. Let's see, we have all these options. You can create your own patterns. And transparency? PNG, anyone? But we are on the hunt for a tiger. Oh, I hope it's in here. Eee! It's empty. Where could it be? 
If you went anywhere on here. Go back one. Gem apps. Hmm. Well, I guess we gotta try some of our other discs. We'll put in gem desktop again in drive B. Well, unless it's on the MS-DOS disk, which I doubt, we may be out of luck. Images. What the f <gasps> Why would that be on MS-DOS? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> okay, let's try this one first. Don't know what is going on here. Why would they put that on the MS DOS disk? <laughs> this is fun. I do remember this. There we go, maximize window. <laughs> what I remember is this kind of um, grayscale effect to get the, the shadow on the bottom half of the monitor there. It's funny the things that stick in your mind. Who's this lady here? A latter day Lady Fractic, perhaps. She's even holding Lady Fractic's clipboard. Well, unless the next file is unreadable and faulty, we may be in luck. You know, I was actually starting to plan in my head as I was speaking how I could try and download Tiger, maybe find someone locally that had a PC with a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive. So that would have been the only way. I have been waiting for this moment for 30 years. Give or take. Here goes. There it is. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. There it is, chaps. That is the image that sold me and my dad <laughs> through me on this machine. Rogers. That's a really beautiful piece of artwork, actually. I can see why they used it in the advertising materials. It certainly did the trick. Well, now my retro museum here is complete. I've got the final machine that I had, or my family had, growing up. It is a really nice feeling. The nostalgia is, is complete, although it is obviously a little bittersweet. Even doing this, it's special, but it's never quite the same, is it? And I think that's because my dad's not here to enjoy it with me. But I do all this in his honor, and I want to thank you guys for joining me on this little journey down nostalgia lane and into the past of this very special machine. Why am I patting that on there? I should pat the tiger. Good boy, good boy, please don't bite me. Well, thanks everyone for watching. I'll be back soon. As always, subscribe below. And cheerio. Go to weird ballerina fish lady. Oh, the bottom came off. Put the bottom back on. There you go.